Kathleen Tuttle. Oh, let's see. I got it. We're starting to record, record, so that's great. At any rate, tonight with us is Kathleen Thomas, and I think many of you know her from over the years, either because you've been her patient, you've heard her lectures, or you've seen her and I out on the bike trails. Um, she's going to talk to us tonight about shock, and just so you know her background, I could go on and on for probably the whole lecture time because she and I ride together. So I know a lot about her, but I'll limit it to letting you know that she, unlike me, is a really good skier. And even though she's not a patroller like some of the lectures, she could be because she you know, grew up skiing, was on her college's race team and so forth and so on. But enough about that. Uh, I don't wanna take up your time. So Kathleen, take it away. And I'll let you know if there are questions or we'll play it by ear. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have to tell you, my college race team was a very long time ago. <laughs> okay, so tonight's lecture is on shock. And um, there's four different types of shock and I'm just gonna go through each one. Okay, shock is when the tissues and the organs in the body don't get enough oxygen. Oxygen helps the cells make energy, and without energy, the cells will die. Shock must be recognized immediately and the cause determined, otherwise it can be fatal. When the body is in shock, blood flow is diverted to the essential organs, the heart and the brain. Less essential organs, such as the kidney, liver, lungs, and bowel, show damage first. <clears throat> the types of shock, cardiogenic shock is when the heart isn't pumping adequately. Hypovolemic shock is when there isn't enough intervascular volume. Obstructive shock is when something is obstructing tissue perfusion. And distributive shock is something that alters blood vessel permeability or dilation. So I'm gonna go back to this little gas pump analogy because it makes it easier to understand. So in this little gas pump, the heart is the pump, the hose is your blood vessel, the blood is the gas, and then the tissues in your body are the car. Signs of cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is when the pump is not pumping gas adequately. And that's our heart. So the heart, a heart attack causes muscle, there's several different kinds, but heart attack causes muscle damage, therefore poor circulation. Other causes of cardiogenic shock can be irregular heart rhythm, either fast or slow. When it's fast, the heart does not have enough time to fill. And when it's slow, it's not efficient to circulate blood. Many drugs affect the heart rate and the blood pressure, especially people that are taking medications uh, for blood pressure or heart disease or irregular heart rhythm. Um, men and women uh, tend to have different symptoms on heart attack. Men tend to be more classic. Uh, they have sweating, pain in the left side of their chest, left arm, neck, or jaw, shortness of breath, and uh, heartburn or indigestion. Women can have classic signs, but they can also have more nebulous signs like dizziness, uncomfortable pain between their shoulder blades in the back. Shortness of breath, indigestion, or unexplained fatigue or sleep disturbance. Okay, back to our gas pump analogy. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. So now we're talking about the hose, which is the blood vessels. Okay, I think and that's, that's, sorry, this is gonna be the gas and that's hypovolemic shock. So here we go, hypovolemic shock is lack of blood or fluid and it's caused by dehydration, volume, sorry, vomiting, diarrhea, or loss of blood due to hemorrhage. Hypovolemic shock is the most common type of shock and that's probably the most common type of shock that you will see. Symptoms of hypovolemic shock are confusion, restlessness or irritability, pale, cool, clammy, possibly bluish skin, thirst, rapid pulse, weak pulse, rapid breathing, and can have nausea or vomiting. Now back to our gas pump. 
the next type is obstructive shock. And that's when the gas hose is blocked. So something's blocking the blood vessel. Causes of obstructive shock are pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, or pulmonary embolism. So pneumothorax is increased interthoracic pressure, which decreases, so that's the pressure inside your uh, chest cavity, which decreases blood getting back to the heart. So on this one, uh, you can see this is a picture of a pneumothorax. And you can see on the right side of the picture, you can see lung markings, which are those little white kind of uh, lines on the right. And then you see the heart. And then on the left, where you see the red arrow, that is where the lung has collapsed. And then there's air on the outside. So you can see the border of the lung. And you can get pneumothoraxes from trauma. You can have a spontaneous pneumothorax. A friend of mine got one pulling weeds but he had, uh, he had radiation as a kid. So he had a weakness on, in his chest. Um, and when you have a pneumothorax and you're listening to someone's lungs, you would hear dramatically decreased breath sounds on the side where the lung is collapsed, if it was a big enough pneumothorax. Then there's something more serious called a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax is when, so the air pressure outside your lung is greater than inside your lung. And um, so let's say you had a, uh, like a stab wound or like a tree branch went through the chest cavity. Um, and so that's allowing air to get into the chest cavity, like a sucking chest wound. And because the air outside is greater than the pressure inside, it collapses the lung. So in this picture, the lung is completely collapsed and the heart mediastinum has been shoved over to the left. And then the left lung is probably only 60% inflated because every time they deep breathe, that air on the right side gets greater. And that's a, a really an emergency because they can quickly die from that. That's also, when you think about it, when we are at altitude, like at, in Park City, our air pressure is less than it is in Salt Lake. And the higher up you go, the less the air pressure. So that's why it's harder to breathe when you go up to higher al altitude. Okay, the next type of obstructive shock is cardiac tamponade. Hang on a sec. Okay, cardiac tamponade is when blood, blood gets into the pericardium, which is the tough fibrous membrane that covers the heart. Due to pressure from the fluid, the heart can't expand and therefore it can't pump adequately. And uh, many years ago when I was working in the ICU at the University Hospital, we had a guy who was a, a rodeo rider and a bull stomped on his chest and he had cardiac tamponade and we had to put a little uh, tube into the pericardium and like every four hours, we had to drain the blood out until, his, until it healed. So be careful of rodeo riding. All right, so then the third type is pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is where there is a blockage in the blood flow to the pulmonary arteries going to the lungs. Pulmonary embolism is caused by blood clots that travel, from, travel to the lungs from deep veins in the legs, rarely from the arms. This happens after the legs have been immobilized for a long time, like somebody who had been on a long plane flight or immobilized in a cast or a boot after an injury or surgery. Symptoms of pulmonary embolism can be shortness of breath, which is worse with exertion, chest pain that can feel like a heart attack, or it can be a sharp pain with deep breathing, it can stop a person from taking a deep breath or talking. Pain can increase with coughing or bending and the sputum can be blood tinged. Other signs are a fast pulse, dizziness, sweating. You can have leg pain or swelling or cool clammy and or cool clammy skin. So this is a picture of a DVT. And um, so when you look at uh, somebody who has a DVT, one leg will be larger, one calf will be larger than the other, 
it can, it'll be warm, red, and swollen. And sometimes when it's early, it's hard to see, but when it becomes, uh, you know, after it's gone on for a couple of days, you can really see it. The other thing you can see is when somebody is like lying down and both their legs look the same color, but then they stand up, the leg with the deep vein thrombosis will turn red. It turns kind of not totally red, but kind of a, a darker pink color. Okay, back to our gas pump. The last type of shock is distributive shock. And that's when the gas hose is not working properly, not from obstruction, but for another cause, like let's say the hose was punctured or leaky. Causes of distributive shock, sepsis, when a bacterial infection, so this is, a, sepsis is when the infection's in the blood. Bacterial infection releases toxins causing blood vessels to dilate, then the blood pressure drops and can be fatal. Anaphylaxis, a severe allergic reaction, which can happen really fast in five to 30 minutes. And anaphylaxis, as you know, can be caused from insect, insect bites, stings, food allergies, most commonly nuts, fish, shellfish, milk, eggs, or preservatives, and drugs like penicillin, the ones that are most common are penicillin, aspirin, ibuprofen, and anti-seizure medications. The other type of distributive shock is neurogenic shock due to trauma or an injury to the spinal cord causing irregular blood circulation. Okay, symptoms of sepsis low blood pressure, fast heart rate, and a lot of these symptoms are really similar for all kinds of shock. Low blood pressure, fast heart rate, fast respiratory rate, dizziness, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting, cold, pale, clammy skin, shaking and chills, oh, and confusion. Symptoms of anaphylaxis, throat or tongue swelling, wheezing, Inspiratory strider from throat swelling and inspiratory strider sounds more like this, like, like when they breathe in, it goes, as opposed to wheezing when you breathe out, it goes, uh, fast pulse, itchy rash, angioedema, which is swelling of the eyes or lips, and a hoarse voice or coughing. So this is a classic allergic reaction rash. This is hives. Tongue swelling. And if his tongue is swelling, swollen, you can bet his throat's going to be starting to get swollen too. And this is angioedema. And this little kid, his eyes are so swollen, he can't open it. But a lot of times we see the lips, uh, you know, the lips and the mouth, and sometimes the tongue sticking out from angioedema. Symptoms of neurogenic shock. Spinal cord injuries cause damage to the sympathetic nervous system which is your fight or flight response. Think adrenaline, like you're gonna go fight the, uh, the polar bear. Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure and respiratory rate. When the, paras when the sympathetic nervous system is damaged, the parasympathetic nervous system takes over and everything slows down. Think rest and digest. Decrease, decrease pulse, blood pressure and warm, dry skin. So that's the only kind of shock that the skin isn't blue, cold, and clammy. Spinal cord injuries can cause problems walking, loss of control of bowel or bladder, can't move arms or legs, numbness and tingling, pain in the back, head, or neck. It's important to recognize shock. Except for neurogenic shock, the symptoms of shock are the same. Increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, cool, pale, clammy skin, increased respiratory rate, restlessness, anxiousness, or confusion. So treatment, after you've recognized it, follows your X, A, B, C, D, E. So number one, control bleeding, which would be the big thing, you know, for uh, hemorrhaging from hypovolemic shock. Airway, immobilize the spine, optimize ventilation, improve circulation, keep them warm, you can lie them flat, assess and reassess the level of consciousness, and e-exposure and environmental issues, check for any injuries that could have been missed, like internal bleeding. I'm going to show you some pictures of internal bleeding. 
So this is Gray Turner's sign. And this is uh, when the your flanks, they're bruised and that's from internal bleeding and it has leaked out into the subcutaneous fat and tracked around the outside. And this is called Cullen's sign, which is the same thing. The blood has tracked through the subcutaneous fat and has turned purple around the umbilicus. And then raccoon eyes is bruising around the eyes. That's a sign of a, a skull or brain injury. Internal bleeding, you can't see it. It can be in the tissues, organs, or cavities of the body, like the abdomen, chest, head, or spinal cord. Internal bleeding may be very hard to identify. People on blood thinners are at increased risk, even from minor injuries. Bleeding in the brain can look like a stroke. You can have weakness on one side of the body, difficulty speaking, or a sense of numbness. Special populations in shock. Children and young adults have amazing ability to compensate for blood loss. They may appear relatively normal on a quick scan, Look closely for signs of shock. Elderly often take medications that prevent the heart rate from increasing like beta block blockers to keep their blood pressure low and it slows the heart rate, or they could have a pacemaker. So they may not have a fast pulse when in shock. Athletes can have a very low resting heart rate in the 40s. So a pulse of 90 could be very fast for them. And pregnant women have 50% more blood volume so they can lose a lot of blood before it's noticeable. I had a friend who was, this was a long time ago, who was skiing at Park City and she was 16 and another skier hit her. And she went to the clinic with abdominal pain and um, they couldn't find anything wrong with her. And they called her mother to come and pick her up. And her mother said, um, you know, to the nurse or whoever called and said, well, what's she doing? And they said, she's curled up on the table with abdominal pain. And she said, call the ambulance. And she met her at the hospital and she had a ruptured spleen. And uh, so young people can really compensate. So you've got to always remember that when you're looking at them. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Or comments? Kathleen, <clears throat> uh, I think I'll comment a little bit. Um, you know, I think that is just great. That really lays it out there. Um, what I'd like to reinforce for all of us tonight, um, and then Kathleen, someone has asked, well, I'll let you do this first. Can you redefine distributive and neurogenic shock? Okay, so uh, neurogenic shock is a spinal cord injury and it's, they call it dysautonom dysautonomia. So um, like when somebody um, has dysautonomia, they um, like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. So let's say they had um, injury to the spinal cord and they had a leg injury. And so normally, or let's say they had bleeding and normally their heart rate would increase and your blood pressure would decrease. Or, and when you have dysautonomia, it's, it's backwards. It doesn't compensate. Or they can be, someone with dysautonomia can be in a, in a really, um, cold room and they're sweating. So it's, um, it's kind of a crazy type of thing. And I suppose, you know, initially on the hill, if somebody had a spinal cord injury, it would be so quick that you probably wouldn't really notice it, except they would have warm, dry skin. And cardiogenic shock is when the heart's not working. So like a heart attack, uh, congestive heart failure, or something like that, or maybe a, um, you know, irregular heart rhythm. Right. And that Ryan also asked you to go over the type of bruising that you described again. I don't know if you can go back to those great pictures or not easily. I can. Great. So this is when somebody has internal injury, like, in, like let's say they lacerated their liver or their spleen, and maybe they have kind of a distended belly and complaining of belly pain. And you pull up your shirt and you see this, right? You see this bruising on either side of their flank that is a sign that something serious is going on internally because the, the blood is tracking through the subcutaneous fat. And that's the same with this one around, the, uh, around their umbilicus, their belly button. That's a sign that there's probably some internal bleeding. 
and the other, the next one is uh, similar. It's like on the flank. And then the raccoon eyes are from bleeding, like from a, um, like a skull fracture. And, and how quickly does this bruising like this appear? Well, it takes a little while, maybe like a half an hour. Depending, it probably depends on how bad the bleeding is. Okay, well that, that brings up what I was about to say. You know, when we apply all this knowledge about shock and think through the different types and what each type, some of the things that can cause it, you know, when we put that into practical terms and what all of you are doing every day is when you come on the sign of a wreck or someone in the lodge or whatever you do while you're doing your duties, you know, the first thing you should be saying is, is this one that's, oh my gosh, I need to do something right now. I'm not going to be one that I'm going to be stepping back, asking a lot of questions you need to act. In other words, you know, as Kathleen said, the ABCs and X and all that. Um, and that's really what it comes down to is you'll be, you'll be acting right away. Because if someone is in shock, you know, hopefully you'll be able to tell very, very quickly and act very, very quickly, because you don't, they're going to die. Right. What? And the, the thing is, Winnie, is that all three, the most common types of shock, you know, uh, the heart or the hypovolemic shock, they're bleeding. All those symptoms are the same. You know, they're restless, their heart rate's fast, their blood pressure's low, they could be confused. They're, you know, they're, they're pale, they're clammy. The only thing is you got to be careful with kids and, you know, people in their 20s, because they can compensate for a long time. Right, which, which really brings up what I, the point that I'm working toward, which is what I think our biggest charge is, is to be a step ahead. And so every time you come upon the scene of an accident or someone who's down in the lodge or whatever it would be, you want to be thinking ahead and say, could this person have impending shock or does the circumstances of their injury or their medical situation mean I need to be thinking that they could go into shock because those are the ones that you're really going to make a difference on. If you get to the scene of an accident and someone has had a bad enough injury that they ruptured their spleen and they're already unconscious, your chance of saving that person are pretty slim. If, if you come onto into the lodge and there's someone my age who's down and they're unconscious and have had a heart attack and have been out for two minutes, you know, again, your chance of them walking out of the hospital is really, really small. On the other hand, if you go on that scene and you see someone who's hit a tree, has a broken femur, a fracture obvious of their arm, and they hurt in their belly, you know, even though they're vital signs, when you look at them and do the things you would do to determine how they're doing, because you won't have a blood pressure cuff or some of the things that would be more accurate. You, what you want to say is, oh my gosh, this person could go into shock if we don't act really quickly. If you come into the lodge and someone's having chest pain, you say, oh my gosh, I need to act very quickly because if they have a heart attack and go into shock, our chance of you know, getting them going is really, really small. So what I want you to, every patient you come upon, be first thing you do and is, and, and it's what I did every day when I walked into every patient room, I'd even say, is this something that's four plus emergency or not? And if it's not, then I start, start my normal stuff. But I also am saying, could it become that emergency? And those are the ones that your quick actions and getting help and getting transported and all that uh, are very, very vital. I also wanted to tell you a story to reinforce what Kathleen talked about, you know, looking at things over time. Uh, I may have told this story to some of you before, but it's worth telling again because I haven't forgotten it, even though it happened decades ago. And that was, I got a call from a patroller who said, Winnie, you know, uh, we were out partying last night and had quite a bit to drink and I'm here working. And one of my friends just ran into uh, the lift post. And even though it was covered, he hit pretty hard. And when I responded to him, you know, I didn't know he was skiing today. He, I got there and I could smell the alcohol before I got close to him. So he, he kept drinking when I went home. And when I got to him, he knew who I was. And he said, oh, my stomach hurts a little bit. Just let me go home. I guess I need to sleep this off. But 
you know, uh, he took him down to the patrol shack and did his vital signs and his vital signs were completely normal by our measures of normal. And he called me up and says, he wants to go home. His vital signs are normal. He's still complaining of the, the uh, right-sided abdominal pain, but he says he just needs to go home and sleep. And I said, convince him to stay. I want you to call me back in a half an hour and tell me what his vital signs were. And uh, he called me back and he is, his pulse had gone from 60, he was an athletic person, to 75. And his blood pressure had dropped a little bit. His pain was a little more. Uh, he still wanted to go home, but we convinced him to go to the hospital where they took out his spleen. And he would have died if he had gone home and go to sleep. So the other point I'd like to get across is again, thinking ahead, but also realiz realizing that even with people who you have, one of our real allies is comparing things over time. So anyhow, that's, that's my take home for you today, but I've got some more questions for you, Kathleen. Okay. Um, this is a very good one. What is done for shock in the hospital setting? If we recognize shock and treat it in the field for it, uh, is that what is the next step in the controlled setting in order to set you all up the best success when we transfer? Really good question. So the the uh, first thing they would do is uh, give them IV fluid and that would temporarily, so they would give them whatever they have. Like in the ambulance, they'd give them, you know, saline or lactated ringers. And then when they got to the hospital, uh, they would probably give them blood products because uh, that'll stay intervascularly longer. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then they give them uh, pressors, which would be like epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, and that's a drip that goes in to their arm. And that's, uh, you know, it causes vasoconstriction. So it causes the blood vessels to constrict. And that temporarily will keep the blood pressure up until they can figure out what's wrong. Like, you know, like, okay, we've got to treat, this person's got a heart attack. We got to treat that or they're bleeding or their spleen or whatever the cause of shock is. It buys them time until they can, treat the cause of shock. Yeah, that, that's the big thing. The, the difference between our setting, we are stabilizing, get them out of there. In the hospital setting, they're stabilizing, keep them alive, doing what they need to do till they find out the cause and then treating the cause. And, yeah. and uh, again, what we do in the field is so very vital because from that moment to when they're in impending shock, to when they're in frank shock, you know, that continuum, depending on what the reason is, can be longer or shorter. And the sooner in that sequence that we get them to air, the more likely they are to survive and be normal. And you know, when you're thinking about the kinds that you're gonna see, you know, where they said hypovolemic shock is the most common. So that would be from bleeding. So if it's, you know, if it's an obvious source of bleeding, really trying to control the bleeding or the hemorrhage, you know, tourniquet, packing wounds, whatever you got to do. Yeah. And, and, and Kathleen makes a good point that I'll, I'll emphasize, you know, in, in my experience for more than a few years, if you had to list the number of people who are in shock and the cause, the overwhelming great, great majority are people, because we're seeing trauma, who have hypovolemic shock from the type of injury, whether it be a busted spleen, a busted liver, a rupture of you know, their lung or you know, their stomach, all those things. So you know, getting fluids to them early and in our situation, you know, even though you may have called the ambulance if you're near the bottom, in our clinic, we can get two IVs going. Um, so you know, uh, if you're getting them off the mountain, you know, as soon as the chopper gets there, you'll see one of the first things they do is get fluids going because as, as Kathy said, even the other types of shock, which are rare and we'll probably never see, that's gonna help because more volume is, you know, uh, sometimes you have to do other things with it in the very rare types, but more volume is usually gonna be helpful. And one other thing is, it's a lot easier to get an IV in if the person's body temperature isn't really cold. <laughs> Because then the blood vessels, you know, you can't find them. So keeping them warm is, is uh, important. Right. And, and, and you'll see, or you could see, especially in children, that, that you know, our emergency medical service personnel, whether it be the paramedics or, or the, 
life light chopper, they will sometimes do a thing called an interosseous stick where they will stick right in, into a child, for example, into the bone and give fluids that way. And why? Because it's so rapid and you can get in there and sometimes, especially with our cold patients, finding a vein or a small child finding a vein at all is difficult. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions or thoughts? Four stories you want to share? <laughs> Well, you know, this is, this is where virtual is harder because I can't see everyone's faces and see who's asleep and who's on their cell phone and who's eating. But since no one has written anything more or spoken up, we'll let you go tonight. And Kathleen, thanks again. Uh, it's always a good review to think through the physiology and the different types and, you know, talk about some of these cases. So with that said, I see lots of thank yous uh, to you, okay. Kathleen, as do I. Good night, everybody. Yep. Thank you.